Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program. What's Trending? Digital Content Formats and Subjects to Plan for in 2023, which is sponsored by Overdrive Academic. Uh, so right now, I'm just going to launch a quick poll. And so please, you know, take a, cute, uh, a couple seconds to fill it out, and we'll look at the responses later in the presentation. Uh, so this session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Okay, so as mentioned, today's program is on digital content formats in 2023, featuring speakers from Overdrive, Canopy, and Elsevier. So our speakers today are Kenny Cruz, who is the digital content librarian at Overdrive Academic, Suzanne Hall, who is the global vendor relations manager of reference solutions at Elsevier, and Wendy Chamberlain, who is the senior manager of content program programming at Canopy. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Kenny. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from around the world. Um, today's agenda, we are going to be at first going through the key findings of our 2022 State of eBooks survey. Um, next, we'll be uh, looking into trends in digital content as well as some content uh, collection recommendations heading into 2023 from both myself, Overdrive, and Canopy. Um, and then finally, we'll be wrapping things up with looking into some trends from El that Elsevier is seeing in the industry. So to start things off, our key findings from the 2022 State of eBooks survey. Um, in the year 2022, we did uh, Overdrive and Choice conducted a survey of more than 200 academic librarians from both public and private institutions to learn more about how libraries are continuing to pivot towards um, digital resources in lieu of physical resources. Uh, to nobody's surprise, curriculum support seems to be the uh, dominant element in academic collections. 68% um, of our respondents said that three-fourths or more of their digital collection is dedicated to curriculum support, and that usually means um, books that are, are dedicated to supporting um, classes and syllabi from across campus. Um, but the share of trade books, code curricular ebooks, are becoming a growing portion of these academic collections as well. Um, most of our, uh, sorry, excuse me, 25% of our respondents uh, have noted that they're acquiring um, more ebooks and audiobooks from both popular fiction and nonfiction genres, which is an 8% jump from 2020. And please let me know if I'm speaking a little fast. I have a tendency to kind of just go. 90% <laughs> um, of our respondents. Uh, noted that they are, have added additional resources in the last two years. Um, these resources can include databases and journals, co-curricular books and video, such as the trade books, uh, trade book ebooks and audiobooks mentioned earlier, as well as the um, lion's share of curriculum support materials. Also, participants noted that they are, are increasingly interested in streaming media, especially video. Question 12 of our survey um, asked respondents to uh, gauge how their library budget has been impacted over the past two, two years during the pandemic. And despite seeing overall downturn in budgets across the board, our survey actually gave us a bit of a mix, more mixed environment. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to be diving in now to a little bit, uh, a couple of trends that we're seeing in different content types, as well as digital formats. So this is my specialty area here at Overdrive, where I serve as the Overdrive comics and manga expert. We have seen a huge expansion of manga and comic books in academic spaces. 791% increase in checkouts in both of these types of formats in 2021 and 2022, including a 61% increase in spend from academic librarians purchasing more content for their collections. As mentioned before, co-curricular reading is a growing aspect of any academic collection. Um, in the fiction categories, we're seeing a lot of movement in literary and popular fiction. Um, like I said before, growing manga and comics catalogs, um, in addition to uh, uh, people using utilizing our uh, all access comics package. Um, there seems to be a movement towards audiobook um, from a patron standpoint, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we dive a little bit into the formats, but audiobooks seem to be the most popular movers among patrons of academic librarians, uh, academic libraries, as well as uh, regional specific delves into niche content. So that's content that is more um, directed towards serving specific communities within uh, a library's uh, patronship. On the nonfiction side, scholarly leaning contents, autobiographies, and historical content, to no one's surprises, kind of the lion's share of this stuff, uh, as well as university press content. Um, academic librarians seem to really enjoy um, expanding the horizons with diversity, equity, and inclusion content. And then we're also seeing uh, a lot of movement in professional development and career readiness. Um, I'm going to delve into a little bit more specifics on these. Uh, on these topics here and uh, near couple next couple of slides. So formats. Overdrive offers audiobooks, magazines, and ebooks in digital format. Um, among our customers, we're seeing about an almost uh, even 50-50 split with audiobooks taking up just a little bit less space than ebooks are, and magazines are kind of a newer format to Overdrive. They're smaller, but they're growing quickly. And one of the uh, kind of paradoxical trends that we're seeing now is that while ebooks seem to be more popular among our purchasers, patrons are preferring audiobooks. Uh, we've seen a 30% year over year increase in audiobook checkouts compared to 15% in ebooks and 39% year over year increase by the uh, librarians purchasing ebooks as well. So something to keep in mind when you're looking to expand your collection, patrons seem to be um, more driven towards audiobooks these days. We're also seeing a movement uh, in academic publishers, um, as well as a push from academic librarians for more open access content. This is a trend that we're seeing across the board um, for free content to students and faculty. This generally is um, content that is um, their academic uh, reports or uh, research essays, um, normally federally funded or funded by uh, public interest. And we're seeing them flow into Overdrive now as either free or really low cost content. So keep an eye out for that. I mentioned before that one of the big movers that we're seeing in the non uh, excuse me, in the nonfiction section is uh, career development and uh, uh, career readiness. Uh, one of the report things that we see in our report, five higher ed trends to watch in 2023, is that more than 39% of respondents said that their college did not help them develop skills to, pre to prepare for the transition from college into the workplace, which is a little bit of a bummer fact. <laughs> but uh, we've actually seen a 14% year-over-year -year average growth in career readiness checkouts. So when those books are in collections, they tend to start moving a lot more year over year. Uh, additionally, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a really great topic that we've seen been seeing people add to their collections over the past couple of years. 
um, including some of these great titles that are listed below, including the most uh, uh, challenged book of 2022, Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe. Um, since 2019, we've seen an uptick of mental health and mental wellness books, um, no doubt in, um, kickstarted by the uh, travails of the pandemic years. Um, during 2020, we saw a 64% increase in purchasing from academic librarians on mental health and mental wellness books, as well as uh, an uptick in checkout of those same books across that same amount of time. Colleges doubled their spend since 2019 on mental health related ebooks and audiobooks. And next, I'm going to be handing things off to uh, Wendy Chamberlain, my uh, colleague at Canopy, to talk a little bit more about video in the academic market. Thank you, Kenny. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Chamberlain. I'm the senior manager of content programming at Canopy. I'm very excited to be here today, and thank you so much for joining us in this webinar. So just to start by telling you a little bit about Canopy, uh, Canopy is the leading provider of streaming educational video resources to academic institutions and public libraries in the U.S. and around the world. We have over 30,000 videos that cover a wide range of subjects, which include business, the arts, education, global studies, health, media, the sciences, social sciences, as well as technical and instructional videos. With the advent of streaming video, we've seen video increasingly being used in an academic environment over the last several years. Uh, last month, a very interesting research report was published by Ithaca SNR that talked about the benefits and challenges of teaching with streaming video. And in it, it noted that studies have repeatedly demonstrated that video can increase student interaction with interest in and cognition of a topic. It also noted that video illustrates and reinforces course content, diversifies teaching modalities, promotes cultural and linguistic understanding, and introduces a range of perspectives and expertise. From the work that we do at Canopy and how I see video being used every day within curriculum, both in and out of the classroom, this rings very true to me. Today, I'd like to take a few minutes to illustrate how and where we see video resources being used in the academic environment. Although video resources were not the main focus of the 2022 choice survey. The survey does show that video usage among surveyed libraries has increased. Although, as with many digital resources, the last few years has radically affected usage due to the move to virtual learning during the pandemic. I had hoped to include some statistics around changes in use for particular subjects over the last few years, but due to the huge increase that we saw in usage throughout 2020 and into 2021, it was actually hard for me to discern reliable patterns of usage within the data. But what I can show you is the usage across subjects, which has stayed fairly consistent year over year, and I think gives some insight into which departments and majors are finding the video resources available on Canopy most useful. So here you can see the, this graph shows the percentage of total viewing for each of our top subjects. So for example, just over 20% of the academic viewing on Canopy is on videos that are categorized as race and class studies, which is our most popular subject in academia. And you can also see that most of these subjects fall within the social sciences and humanities, which is also supported by the viewing trends seen in the Ithaca SNR research study. And I will put a link to that study um, in the chat for everyone. You'll notice that also that the percentages here do add up to over 100% since some videos fall within multiple subjects. And finally, I'd like to show you some of our top titles in each of these subjects, just so you can get a better idea of what kind of content we have and what we see is popular. So these are titles that are our perennial performers and that we see being assigned across multiple universities in a wide range of classes. 
So you can see here, I Am Not Your Negro, which is an Oscar nominated documentary narrated by Samuel L. Jackson, which explores the continued peril America faces from institutionalized racism. People Like Us examines class and how class affects opportunity in the United States. Bicycle Thieves is an icon of Italian neorealist cinema and a necessity for any film studies program. The Mask You Live In confronts the narrow definitions of masculinity that exists within our American society. Misrepresentation exposes how mainstream media contributes to the underrepresentation of women in positions of power and influence in America. In Central Park Five, Ken Burns tells the story of the five Black and Latino teenagers from Harlem who were wrongly convicted of raping a white woman in New York City's Central Park in 1989. What is democracy reflects on democracy from ancient Athens and medieval Italy to modern day Greece and the United States. Jean Michel Basquiat, the Radiant Child, profiles the New York based graffiti artist from obscurity to notoriety. And finally, Teach Us All examines how the present day United States education system fails to live up to the promise of desegregation as it slides back into a resegregation of its modern schools. So I hope that that gives uh, everyone a little bit better idea of the kind of content that we see um, that's very successful on Canopy and that I think is uh, important to um, academic curriculum. So thank you very much for your time. I'll pass it along to Suzanne. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, my name's Suzanne Hall. I am Global Vendor Relations Manager at Elsevier. And today I'll be talking about some of the trends that we're seeing across digital content and themes in access. I'll take a particular focus on books in research and education. So let's jump right in. Uh, when I was asked to participate um, in this presentation by Overdrive, I asked some of my colleagues in strategy, publishing, sales, what, what they're seeing, what themes are going on right now. And particularly through the lens of books, we're seeing a lot of focus on artificial intelligence and machine learning as a subset of AI and its use and application in research and education. There is a lot going on in the space of sustainable development goals from the United Nations and how that's actually informing our publishing program and our and the, the trends that we're seeing in terms of the sales of titles that support the SDGs. Similarly to what Kenny mentioned, there's a lot of um, demand for foundational content or content that supports curricula. This is especially relevant to, to us at Elsevier as in the science and technology space in particular, which I'm part of. There really has been a focus on postgraduate and research level content. So what we're finding through the lens of the recent pandemic is actually there's great demand for the educational learning resources and that we are actually um, providing support there as well. So artificial intelligence, I think we were all um, bombarded with news stories in January about chat GPT and how it would affect education and research. Uh, there's also um, quite some concern about the academic integrity of any output or uh, content generated by artificial intelligence. You can see on the right there, some of the articles that I pulled from the scholarly kitchen um, reflecting just that. And of course, I got on and had a look at ChatGBT, and my experience was that, indeed, when I asked the question, um, write me a 2,000-word essay on whether artificial intelligence can own a patent in Australia and New Zealand, yes, it was very nicely written, but and it also included the correct legislature, but it didn't include any 
sources or citations. So that would be absolutely an instant fail. And I felt relieved. So um, yes, there are some real issues there. In terms of um, academic integrity and, and moral rights of authors, um, it's, it's not just about the integrity, it's also a legal right that authors are acknowledged or attributed for their work. So that's something that's um, really on my mind about chat GPT. In terms of um, Elsevier's own thoughts about artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning, we've actually found it to be quite a positive story. Next slide, here we are. So what we've found actually is through our feature called Topics on Science Direct, we have found that this particular feature, which is using machine learning to generate content from our books and journal material, we actually have created a, a free layer, which is accessible to everybody. And within that, um, it can be accessed via Google. So you can see on the left, someone's popped in polarization resistance into the search. And one of the first results, the first in this case, um, is our, one of our topics on Science Direct. It gives you definitions which are drawn from actual um, peer reviewed content and attributed related terms. So you can have that lovely serendipitous experience in research as you're learning and exploring new concepts in science. You can have the more in-depth content, which is again drawn from our books and journal articles. So you can get a little more information. And we also include pedagogical features, as you can see in four. So there we have a table, but we also have features like virtual mic microscopes and things like that. So this is intended to help students and researchers understand more about scientific terms when they need it. So topics also support faculty um, in providing content um, to their students in the online environment. So on the topics page, the lecturer or instructor can uh, search and find a topic and provide that definition linked into their learning management system or teaching environment. And what is really nice about this is that it allows students and researchers who are coming into a brand new area to get up to speed really quickly with, with terms. You can see here, um, this student or researcher has gone into neuroscience and they can see a term highlighted in blue. In this case, it's the amygdala. Click on it, and then it opens up your topic in Science Direct and gives you the definition and all of the other features I spoke about earlier. Now, why does this matter? It matters because it's actually become our second most popular feature on the Science Direct platform, generating just under 20 million visits a month. So there are more than 360,000 of these topics generated by machine learning um, across 20 different science and technology subject areas, uh, linking 5 million journal articles and thousands of, of our books, including major reference works, encyclopedias, treaties, um, so all peer-reviewed content. And interestingly, given our user base has traditionally been thought of as postgraduate research level, 69% of our users on this feature are students. The second thing that we've been seeing is a real focus on the sustainable development goals and the um, impact of that in research output. This particular screenshot is taken from our Relex, which is Elsevier's parent company, Resource Centre. So in this, we link free resources, open access materials from books and journals to the 17 sustainable development goals. We specifically in books have published 
almost 750 titles or have in development um, materials that particularly support the sustainable development goals. And here we've highlighted a few across um, the, the various 17 um, items. We also have 11 plus affiliated uh, collections of, of works across various, um, various subject areas. So agricultural, biological and food sciences, for example, supporting um, no poverty and zero hunger, biomedical sciences and medicine and biomedical engineering, for example, on supporting health and well-being. And the, the list goes on. So, so really, we do um, link very nicely into the, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. In terms of Elsevier's own goals, uh, we have committed to being net zero in terms of our emissions by 2040 at the latest. And in the way that that manifests in itself, um, you can download our climate action report. But one example is the energy with a purpose promise that we have in our publishing group, which means that for all energy titles, which are published now and into the future, and also our backlist titles, they must have a sustainability um, focus by the end of 2024. Now, the education and learning focus, this was something that became very clear as we moved through the pandemic years. So the, the themes and the, um, and the environment was that students were adapting to an online remote environment. Faculty was quickly adapting to support students also while working at the, in this way. And librarians really forming that critical nexus where they were supporting students, faculty, all of their patrons with information. So um, at this time, um, Elsevier was one of the first um, organizations to open up our textbooks on Science Direct to provide support. And through this experience, um, we have really seen how impactful that can be. Um, as a result, now we've increased our publishing um, presence in that space, so in the curriculum support, and also included um, more information or pedagogical features in some of our monographs, which have application in the classroom. So it's not just books where we support education and learning at Elsevier. We also support through our um, abstracting and indexing service, um, which is Scopus and Reaxis, which is our chemistry database, as well as the obvious of, of Science Direct with our books and journals. Speaking of books and journals, What's um, what we're looking at here is um, a triangle which shows how books are relevant over a very extended period of time, especially our encyclopedias and comprehensives. So they're very relevant over a very long period of time. And journals, for example, are, re are very narrow in focus and tend to have that um, real immediacy. So what we find is that a lot of usage from students is down um, at the at the lower end of this of this triangle. So you have your encyclopedias, you have your textbooks, and then you have your text reference hybrids, which is that cross between the text and the monograph. Um, so can be used in research, but also can be applied in the learning environment. This goes into a little bit more information about the types of support that we have. Um, so we have 250 plus textbooks, uh, 710 hybrid text references, which can be used in both research and classroom, uh, 200 plus major reference works, and 
35,000 monographs book series. This is my last slide, and it's just to give you a snapshot of some of the things I mentioned before. Our most used titles uh, tend to be our major reference works. Um, this one is showing the International Encyclopedia of Social and Behavioral Sciences, huge work of 27 volumes uh, published in 2015. And um, textbooks such as the MATLAB and hybrids, um, here you can see Ratner's Biomaterial Science. And um, those are, are really where we see the greatest usage. And thank you so much for listening. I think we're going into Q&A now. Yeah, great. Thanks so much to Kenny, Wendy, and Suzanne. Uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, before, but before we, so for attendees, feel free to uh, put all your questions into the Q&A and we'll get to those. Um, but first, I just thought I'd reshare the results from the poll earlier um, in the hour. And in case anyone has any thoughts on these, um, the first question was, does your school currently use a digital library for students? And it looks like 81% said yes, and about 19% said no. Um, second question, how do you see intellectual property rights for STM books in the future? 19% uh, said mostly open access, 74%, so majority said mix of open access and traditional royalty model, and 8% said mostly royalty model. And last question, uh, by the end of today's webinar, I hope to understand, 65% said more about reading formats available, and about 35% said how to combat lack of time and increasing educational um, challenges. So does anyone have any thoughts on the results? I'd like to comment on the second question in the poll regarding the open access um, and books. So I was really curious about this one um, because we we are seeing like some publishers moving to open access very aggressively. At Elsevier, we certainly support it. But what we're seeing is that typically authors and they're the ones who are able to drive this, are still opting for the royalty model. We do have a small handful of open access titles, and it's certainly there as a feature. And, you know, no preference is given to either one. Um, but, yeah, really interested in seeing these results. I, I would agree um, a mix of open access and traditional royalty model um, is definitely what we're seeing right now in terms of demand from authors. Generally, that's what we're seeing from publishers as well. Um, is a, a mix of open access, low cost or free content coming through to say at the same time as the traditional royalty model um, uh, titles as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Any final thoughts on the poll or? Okay, great. So we'll, uh... Move on into Q and A. Looks like we already have a few questions in here, so we'll get started. Um, first, we have a question from Erica, who asks, "I love audiobooks when I'm reading for pleasure, but if I am reading for research, I prefer a physical or ebook. Do you all have any data on this, or maybe it's just some anecdotal thoughts?" Um, uh Actually, no hard data. Um, anecdotally, I mean that seems to be a pretty common uh, thread amongst people who read both. Uh, for, for research and for pleasure. Um, I certainly am the same way. Uh, but uh, that is something that we're going to, we'll look into um, for adding to the next year's survey or the next time we do a survey. Great. Okay. Okay. So move on to the next question here uh, for Suzanne. Uh, Virginia asks, um, I think I think I heard you say that the Elsevier topics is machine generated. Just interested to know how these are created. Sure. Um, well, I'm not an expert or a data scientist, but the way that it works is um, Elsevier topics 
uh, has um, the machine is programmed to identify when a new term or a term is included in a journal article in at least five instances. Then it goes on, um, finds the content that matches that in our peer reviewed content, whether it's a textbook, um, typically from a major reference work like an encyclopedia or a treaty, um, and then uh, creates the, the page. So with the definitions, your related terms, um, further information, usually taken, almost always taken from either our books or journals and always provided with the um, with the attributions, the, the author details and all those sorts of things. And then um, including any really pertinent or relevant um, diagrams or methods, for example. Does that answer your question, Virginia? I think so, but um, Virginia, feel free to ask for a follow-up. Uh, great, okay. We have another question here from Kathy who asks, how do you adapt your pricing models for special slash corporate libraries with very narrow subject interests? In other words, not multiple disciplines. That's an interesting question. Um, our pricing for the most part comes from the publishers themselves. So they get to choose the pricing for those um, for each title that they send us or they offer through us. We do also have, um, we do encourage them though on that follow-up uh, we do encourage them to keep in mind, you know, the academic uh, that academic libraries limited budgets and the their ability to um to purchase a, in bulk. We also have simultaneous use packages that uh, have tiered pricing based on the amount of patrons in a library. If that's something that you're interested in looking in, and a lot of those publishers um, offer academic material as well including Taylor and Francis, which just added a huge collection of, I believe, free content. <laughs> okay, great. Let's see, another question here from Julia, who asks, any technical vocational digital resources, especially videos for post-secondary educational institutions? So maybe Wendy, any thoughts on this? I'm sorry, I was just working on answering another question. Can you repeat? Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, any technical vocational digital resources, especially videos uh, for post-secondary educational institutions? Yes. So we actually have a very big collection of technical and vocational digital resources um, for mostly for uh, post-secondary um, and with a wide range of uh, content from you know, food service to uh, engineering or mechanical um, services. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, we actually just put together a guide um, that goes over a lot of our top content in that area. And I would be happy to send that guide through. Um, so if, uh, <clears throat> If it's Julia, see, Julia, yeah, Julia, if you want to share your contact info, um, I'd love to send that to you. Additionally, Overdrive also offers uh, databases and streaming media for uh, academic institutions, including some services that um, have vocational or other training videos. Awesome. Okay. Great. Uh, we have another question here from Virginia who asks, what are your thoughts on the potential impact of chat GPT on the education sector? And maybe Suzanne, if you want to start us off. Yeah, thanks for that question. It is definitely on my mind and the minds of many people. Um, my thoughts are that using chat GPT, for example, in an assessment like an essay, is akin to you know asking or paying someone to to write an essay for you. Um, I, I I believe that um, those concerns regarding um, academic integrity and uh, providing correct acknowledgement for the sources of your work uh, will will really um, 
at this point with the way that chat gpt is now um it really doesn't meet those uh needs very well those are my personal feelings um about chat gpt and I'm, I'm really curious to hear from others as to um what you think yeah kenny or wendy any thoughts on chat gpt Um, from my perspective, I'm not really seeing um, too much of a of a super threat from it right now. <laughs> um, as Suzanne said, that it's still kind of in its infancy, and while it can, you know, you know, spit out something that's fairly well written, it's not well sourced, and also prone to what I assume is plagiarism, because as with all AI. Um, uh, programs that are out there, including the ones that create artwork, they essentially reference existing material um, directly instead of uh, coming up with original thought or with original work. Uh, so the one thing that we'll probably see a lot more here in the future before it starts becoming more sophisticated is rampant plagiarism. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, there was an interesting article last week from Inside Higher Ed about co-authorship with uh, AI and chat GPT. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question here. Um, some parts of the world favor print over ebook publications. Have you seen an increase in ebook publications? How do international press ebooks make it into your databases? Um, that's a great question. Um, so it's, it's an awesome question too, because I used to be on our content acquisitions team here at Overdrive. Um, we work with publishers from around the world to help them um, get their books live at, in ebook uh, on Overdrive. Um, we also offer some services for folks that can't uh, make digital versions themselves or have trouble making digital versions themselves, um, assisting them with conversion of PDFs into uh, formats that are more easily usable in our uh, flagship app Libby. Um, we are seeing an increase in ebook publications. Um, for the most part, we're actually seeing one to one. Um, anytime that there is a print version, there's going to be a digital version, usually sometime along the line, if not simultaneous release. Great. Yeah. Any thoughts from anyone else? Um... I would agree with what Kenny has just said. Um, certainly at Elsevier, we have, I can, we provide all of our um, content via E and it's print on demand for the science and technology content. So Health Sciences takes um, a different approach because that's more targeted towards the, the, um, the, the learning, so in nursing and medicine and the health professions, but in the science and technology space, which is really at um, at the learning, but predominantly at upper level undergrad, postgrad and research level, then most of those titles which are you know printed are printed on demand. And additionally, as the second part of your question of how we get international press ebooks into our databases, we have a team of people um, that go out and speak with publishers to try to get them to put their stuff on overdrive. Um, that's that's kind of it. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a very we have a very, very dedicated team that works very hard. <laughs> Got it. OK, great. Let's see another question. Um, outside of open access, are there any recommendations to offer new or more media to students for those hampered by a limited budget? Any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time? Sure, yeah. It's um, Outside of open access, are there any recommendations to offer new slash more media to students for those hampered by a limited budget? Sure. Um, at Overdrive, we have our simultaneous use packages, which are, as I mentioned earlier, priced by tier of your patronship. Um, and we also have uh, CPC, uh, a large CPC catalog. CPC stands for cost per circulation. Generally, what that means is that uh, you only get you can add the title to your catalog and you only get charged when somebody actually checks it out. 
And usually those put the prices of those titles are anywhere between 50 to 99 cents to we've seen some pretty expensive ones, but generally speaking, they don't go much higher than five bucks. Um, if you are have any questions about uh, additional um, strategies for uh, adding cheaper or lower cost uh, items to your rec uh, to your collection, please let me know and uh, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to work with you. Okay, great. Let's see. Another question. Um, um, how has including new formats like movies and digital books strengthened the learning experience for students? And if anyone has any any examples. Well, I can speak to the video part of that question. And uh, I just want to uh, draw people's attention to the uh, the research report uh, link that I put in chat, um, which I think does a excellent job of answering that question much better than I could do. Uh, although it is actually quite long um, and detailed, but if that's what you're looking for, um, I, yeah, I would recommend reading that. But you know, in my opinion, video, you know, what we're seeing, what I'm seeing definitely in video is that um, as the generation, as the younger generations move into the educational uh, sector and um, as children who have grown up watching YouTube and learning on YouTube get to be college age, uh, we're going to see more and more demand for video within curriculum because a lot of students are going to be used to um, having that as a method for learning. And there are a lot of advantages to that method of learning, um, not just for people who have different, you know, ways of learning, uh, but also because there are some things that just can't be learned through text or at least not learned as well through text, but where images and specifically moving images um, tell a more well-rounded story, uh, you know, make it easier to understand a concept and, you know, do what video do, does best, which is, you know, illustrate in real life um, something that, you know, again, a, a book or, you know, a text may not do as good of a job of. So, that for me is why, you know, I'm very excited to be at Canopy and to be part of that movement um, to, you know, offer video for the next generations and um, in a way that is helpful and beneficial to education. And I think that's sort of, for me, where we are right now and, and why I do find um, studies and research into the subject so fascinating is because it is a new it is fairly new i mean 50 years ago this is not an option um it is an option now but what does that look like how can video best support curriculum and that's what we're learning and that's at canopy what we're always trying to figure out uh so that we can do better and better at supporting our customers okay great um, let's see. Another question. Um, let's see, Kenny, you talked about how audiobooks are on the rise. Um, how much do you think that has to do with in-person classes returning and students slash faculty just, you know, listening on the go again and the ease of audio versus maybe needing to sit down for ebooks, that sort of thing? Actually, I think that the, um, oops, excuse me, I accidentally pressed this button here. Did I mute myself? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I, we've seen a lot of, uh, the, the transition to audiobooks has been more kind of from an entertainment standpoint. People are starting to see uh, audiobooks as more of a primary source of entertainment than they had in previous years. And I guess it's it's more too that more popular fiction, uh, including bestsellers that are coming, are, are getting day and date release of audiobook versions um, as the ebooks or the regular print versions, um, which in the past wasn't always true. It would, the print version would come out and then maybe a year or so later, the audiobook would come out after the fanfare of that title's release had died down. Um, so we're just seeing um, 
a lot of uh, the popularity of it because of the more readily available audiobooks. Um, and again, also because people are starting to turn to audiobooks as a primary source of entertainment. Makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Are you seeing an increase in conversion to ebooks of older backlist titles? Suzanne, maybe? Or yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, during the um, the pandemic, when uh, people were working remotely, there was an increase in those uh, backlist title sales. Um, as I talked about, there was there is a, quite a bit of longevity for uh, books in particular, um, where where we see book content remaining relevant over a long period of time. Um, for example, Elsevier has um, actually created a, a huge um, backlist catalog, um, drawing from seed libraries and uh, libraries all around the world, where we digitized. Um, works and made them available so so there while the focus is always going to be on the newer content i would say for ebooks definitely during the um during the lockdowns we did see an uptick in um in the backlist titles as well okay perfect kenny did you have anything to add on that or Nope, she took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we have another question here from Sean who asks, what formats of eBooks have been most used or requested? You know, PDF, EPUB, other. Do you see a trend away or toward hardware e-readers and the need for formats that match those hardware e-readers? This is an excellent question. And um, one that I'm actually going to couple with another question from in the um, Q&A from MF regarding the transition from the OverDrive app to Libby. Um, by way of formats, in the past, we have accepted EPUB, EPUB, PDF, and a lot of host of others, including um, we have partnership with Kindle to offer um, kind, or with Amazon to offer Kindle formats that, um, you know, trans, that transfer um, titles to your Kindle. Um, we're seeing a trend towards less hardware-based e-readers and more software-based e-readers, which is one of the main reasons why um, there is a large, or excuse me, one of the main reasons why the OverDrive app is being discontinued in favor of Libby. Um, Libby is actually a, um, a very sophisticated web app that uses um, a conversion software to turn books into what we call a proprietary uh a, a proprietary um, format called OverDrive Read, where that can be used on any device that has a web browser attached, to, uh, a modern web browser attached to it. It has a little bit of trouble with the old Internet Explorer, but since that's been discontinued these days, we're not uh, we're not really supporting that too much. Um, but um, Libby itself is more di um, device agnostic than the OverDrive app was, and also easier to develop um, and push out changes for. So uh, to summarize, uh, the, the, the trend that we're seeing is more of a transition towards software-based readers um, that can be used in a, a wider array of devices. And that is the primary reason why the OverDrive app is being discontinued in favor of Libby, which is more sophisticated and can work on more devices. Okay, great. See a few more minutes to answer some questions. Um, just let's see one quick question is when can where can we find the reports and materials referenced in the webinar? And um, I'll put the link to the choice survey in the chat. And Wendy earlier put a link to um, a report. Um, let's see. And we do have another question for Kenny. Um, do you know when OverDrive will be discontinued? My library uses that to fill a lot of patron purchase requests. Uh, if memory serves correct, OverDrive is the OverDrive app has currently been delisted from all app stores. 
Um, so nobody can download it anymore. And those that have been using the Overdrive app will now have a banner at the top um, directing them to download Libby. Um, if you have any questions about that, shoot me an email and um, I can get you in contact with some folks that will be able to will be better equipped to answer some questions that you might have about um, how this change might affect your library. Okay, great. Let's see. Uh, while we wait for maybe a couple more questions, uh, we can maybe pull up the contact side on the next slide just to show everyone's contact information. I think I saw a question in there about canopy pricing from Varinthorn. Sure, yeah. Um, how does canopy determine pricing? Is it by title, annual subscription? Does it operate similarly to a DDA? Wendy, if you want to. Yes, I would love to answer that because I know the answer to this question. <laughs> um, so, and I took some notes here so I didn't forget anything because we have a lot of different um, pricing. Uh, and and I will say that, you know, I'm technically I'm not in our on our sales team. So, you know, I know the high level stuff, but they would be able to answer specific questions. But we have a bunch of different pricing options. Um, we have, you know, our standard PDA, which is like DDA. Uh, we also have a subscription option, which is a flat annual fee called Canopy Base. Um, we have Smart PDA and Smart PDA Lite, which is uh, curated collections that operate uh, with PDA. We have a capped program. Um, we also do title by title pricing. We have perpetual option if you want to buy titles perpetually. And then finally, we have the ability to do upfront purchasing of one and three year licenses. So lots of options um, that we hope work for a variety of budgets. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. And with that, I think we're pretty much at the end. So I'll just close us out here. Um, I'll thank you again. Thank you again to Kenny, Suzanne, and Wendy for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, and thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program. So be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Um, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us, and we hope you learned something new from the session and hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thank you, everyone.